And we're starting off proceedings with the thorny issue of manuscript development and textual variants. Um, Martin, who you'll know obviously, is our principal investigator and co-executive editor, and has just finished your first draft of the manuscript development for Biobodies. And Michael Brennan is editing Rossetti for us, and you're pretty much there, right? Yeah. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much there. So they've both been through this process. And um, robbery under law. And robbery under law, absolutely, yes. Um, they'll be able to talk a little bit about their experience of actually <coughs> going through this, and then we'll open it out to you for any questions. We've got a few that have been sent in in advance that we'll be looking at in a little while, but obviously do add to those as you go along. So I'm going to leave you guys to chat, and I shall drop back in in ten minutes or so. Would you like the list now? Well, I can give you the clicker, Martin. This is the clicker. Okay. You have the clicker. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, um, Welcome, everybody. And <coughs> um, what we wanted to do with this was just really to have a kind of open house session where people could ask any questions they wanted. I can't guarantee to answer them, but. I suppose it's where the people who've got probably um, uh, and Bob uh, furthest down the line with regard to doing MDA TV, um, then uh, you know, we will at least have encountered the practical problems. Um, and I think it's often helpful, um, but, you know, sort of dispatches from the front line, as it were, you know, people saying, uh, you know, make sure you take a pillow kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, there, there are things which, which crop up. I mean, for instance, one of the things that um, rather took me by surprise was how long it took to do. And that, and also how I found I couldn't work really for more than about two hours on this at a stretch. Because you do need total concentration. And even when you've given it your total concentration and you look back, as I, I've excerpted a couple of bits of my talk this afternoon, I thought I'd just double check, you know, make sure. And I found that you know, there were tiny little things that were wrong, uh, even though I thought I had given it my closest possible attention. So, you know, it's a you know, little comma missing or you know, this kind of thing. <coughs> um, so, you know, that, that would be, those would be my opening remarks. You know, allow plenty of time for it. Um, if you're going to say dedicate a work uh, a week um, a day to doing this, then allow for breaks um, every couple of hours. Or so. Um, so what we asked people to do was to submit um, questions that they had, and these are the questions that we we have so far uh, compiled. Um, uh, we've. Uh, Mike has also got another interesting uh, spanner to throw in the works, which is about pagination of manuscripts. Um, mm -hmm. And doubtless, as we're talking, things will bubble to the surface <coughs> for me as well, um, because I've only, as it were, just got to the end of the first draft. That's the other thing I would say, is that I, I only regard this as a first draft, so uh, you're going to have to do it twice, really. <laughs> May, you know, not, certainly spot checking. Anyway. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> okay, so the first first question is a kind of huge question in text and editing generally, of course. What is the substantive? And I'm aware, of course, that we have people on this project uh, who are both highly experienced textual editors. Um, uh, I just worked on Pope, you know, so H.G. Wells, and you know, lots of people. Um, have lots of experience of textual editing. Um, and so this, this first question might seem um, a rather sort of obvious one to them, but we also have, and they have had to have, also people who are even more experts but aren't textual editors. Uh, and so what we're trying to do is to develop a system that people can learn, um, and which is in fact a new system, really. Um, not, it's not you know, completely uh, you know, fresh to the world of scholarship, but I mean, <coughs> the, the system that we're using for MDA TV is, is a new system of annotation. 
And I think it's easier to read. Well, I would think it because I invented it. But I, <coughs> I think it's easier to read for the for the general intelligent reader, you know, for say, you know, an undergraduate, than the conventional system, um, which is used has always been used by say Renaissance and Romantic scholars. <coughs> so when I was having discussions about this with Kelvin. Uh, first of all, he was saying, hey, you're doing it all wrong. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I said, no, we're not. You could have said that anyway, Martin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, I said, well, no, we're not. We're actually, we've invented a new system. He said, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. um, so there, there are a lot of people, of course, who have great investment in the traditional way of doing things. And so the first thing to say is, that's not what we're doing. <clears throat> um, so just to go back to this, this substantive issue, um, I suppose, I mean, we were just talking about this earlier, weren't we? Um, according to conventional textual theory, Greg McCaro, all that stuff, um, a, a, a substantive would be um, a, a variant that altered meaning. And an accidental would be something that had happened kind of accidentally in the process of printing, like a drop letter or a reverse letter or um, you know, something relatively small. Um, but um, the problem, of course, is <coughs> that the distinction, stop me, I mean, you're probably much more expert on this than I, but I mean, the problem, I, as I always saw it, was that <coughs> the distinction that, that Greg McCarrow and Camp wanted to make between substantives and accidentals was a false one. Because accidentals, in other words, the change of one letter, or even the change of a comma, can alter meaning. Mm -hmm. So there are instances where what would normally be described as accidentals would be, in fact, substantives. So <clears throat> the reason this question is asked, I think, is because what we say in our editorial principles and in the handbook is that we're only recording substantive variants. So it's important to know what a substantive variant is. But that could be a comma, if you think it changes meaning. Yeah. It's also, I mean, if I could add one or two things as well, because Macaro and there's people here like Nigel, we went through exactly the same training system, and Macaro is the Bible, the God. Macaro had never edited even in war. <laughs> And that's the crucial difference, because I've found, which is very interesting from Rossetti, his very first work were just almost, he's only just ceased being an undergraduate, Evelyn Moore is still working on that brilliantly polished style that everyone so admires, mm -hmm. to robbery under law, where there are no manuscripts, no typescripts, no proofs, one UK edition that I would argue he didn't have a great deal of interest or contact with because it was a contracted politicized work there was a wonderful um, postcard to his agent with the UK edition saying if I could quote the Yanks are paying me so little how dare they think I'm going to do anything for them they needed to change the title for all I care they can call it the giant panda <laughs> and Peters writes back saying Evelyn very happy with your work and delighted with the new title. <laughs> the thing is, however, that the US one, that first edition, has some very interesting editorial excisions where the UK text makes quite damning commentary on the American diplomacy in Mexico. Um, the US one removes it, but also makes some very interesting errors that the brother of the chap involved, they get us the wrong person. And these things, in some ways, need briefly noted, not in textual and there are others, so there's a difference there. But the thing that I found most important in Rossetti is, as Martin says, substantive altering meaning is relatively straightforward, and that may be a word, a phrase, or a comma, or other kinds of punctuation. But what I've been struck in Rossetti, which I think needs recording in more than just in my commentary and introduction, is that he's often already developing that very powerful axiomatic precision. Millet engaged to Ruskin's wife. She was half Italian, totally pedagogic. And they're a wonderful phrasing, but you can see in the manuscript, these were worked 
towards. Mm -hmm. He's taking out mm -hmm. what might even be regarded as relatively clumsy phrases at the beginning that lead up to this punchline, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And these merit recording, I think, in a way that wouldn't really work if I just listed a few examples in a relevant part of the introduction. Mm -hmm. So that's where I think Macero's rules are helpful in the simplicity, the crudity of the way they operate, and having done a great deal of Renaissance editing, where there are very rarely manuscripts that you're holding against printed editions, you're often editing from the third edition, there isn't a second or first, it works. But for someone where we're seeing in Rossetti, building up to his own first major publication, still learning his own distinctive style, there are substantive <coughs> things that need recording. And I would guess, but obviously people who have been much more expert, that some of the earlier works, other than Rossetti, may have similar qualities, where we're seeing from the manuscript to the printed UK one, usually, a transition in very important style, stylistic qualities. Mm. Um, so that's another element I just throw in, because yeah. that's just my view. Yeah. Uh, well, this continues up through Rise and Revisit, because <coughs> you cancel up to 4,000 words, and he may use some of the phrasing from that cancellation in the rewrite, but there's no way in God's earth to indicate that. You just have to present the cancellation and go on. Mm -hmm. But he was he was developing a different kind of style, of course, in like Rising. Yeah. But you're right about Rossetti. Mm -hmm. that, uh, and there is, there is also a problem with how you actually record that. Um, uh, for instance, I mean, it's, uh, it's not infrequent um, beyond, let's say, um, Handful of Dust, for um, him to, well, actually, he does it in Decline and Fall as well, but to, to have an <coughs> insertion uh, which is on a separate sheet, and he will say, insert. A, right, yeah. and, and so on. <clears throat> How do you actually record that in MDA TV? If somebody wrote to me about this and said, what do I do about this? Uh, there doesn't seem to be anything in the handbook about transpositions. Um, so I made something up which <laughs> <laughs> seems to work, um, which is that when you get something awkward like that, which doesn't fit with the, the kind of basic sort of Meccano kit that you've got about, you know, how you indicate something that's um, been crossed out or deleted within a deletion or um, brought in from above the line or below the line, all that kind of stuff. Um, but for these sort of odd cases, you can just have a brief editorial comment. So you sort of, you know, ED colon in square brackets after it, uh, um, um, EW, um, uh, uh, what I've been doing is saying originally this sentence appeared after Diddly D. Uh, EW marks up the transposition. Um, and that is an MDA TV, is it? Yeah. And not yeah. in the other appendix of the yeah. Um, text. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a, what, what you're trying to do, we're not trying to do, we're not obviously trying to produce um, an exact copy of the manuscript or the, the ability to reconstruct an exact copy, yeah. but we're offering. Um, all of the substantive variants, of which a transposition would be one. So you've got to find a way of. Um, if anybody's got any better ideas, let me know. But, I mean, it would seems it be to, me to sort of work. Well, where um, I think it's useful is the fact that you've actually introduced something discursive, whereas the normal way to do it like British. Yeah, that should be cryptic. Yeah. That, well, and it is. Yes. Yeah, that's what and I think. And I feel like, that yeah. you're on safer ground if you mm. explain it. You know, yeah. Yeah. discursive. Yeah. 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 Um, okay. But you have to edit me back um, when I have been quite descriptive because I've been quite interested in yeah. when he annotates the AMS, where he annotates. Yeah. So in which margin, at right under yeah. the angles of text. And you, you have tended to kind of break me back in. Yeah. So put, put I do a think we need to get it down to a sort of telegraphies. Yeah. You know, like RH margin or yeah. something like that rather than right hand margin. You know. yeah. We need to save space as much as but, we can. But can I just say something in relation to what you said earlier as well? So two things I want to pick up on what, um, what each of you said. One is that, you know, I'm only halfway through chapter one, having edited the additional separate appendix, the, the, um, the separate foreword that Helena had in um, the manuscript version. So I've only done a, a few pages, really. 
but it, I'm absolutely in agreement with you on how much hard work it is. Um, my instinct at the moment is to record everything to get to that first draft. Partly because when you're concentrating, I can't, I don't seem to be able to make the decisions about what to include exactly. when I'm concentrating yeah. Yeah. in that yeah. way. Yeah. So That's I exactly what whether... I found. So I found, I think my MDA thing is far too long at the moment, but I'm, I'm thinking, I'm not yet in a position to, to know whether this needs to be in the final draft. Yeah. Um, uh, and I'm just leaving it. I'm also using MDATV. You might like to have a bit thing, but think about this as a kind of a form at the moment. You know, it will come out, but I mean, a, a way of sending notes to myself. So uh, I've got you know the comments which are sort of Ed Colin, uh, another example of you know yeah. and this kind of thing. And uh, now all that will be extracted eventually. And uh, the, the most uh, interesting examples will be kind of squashed together uh, as illustrative material in the introduction. So, yeah. yeah. I guess my question really is in the spirit of, of that question, which is it's about what, what is the spirit of the judgment about substantive uh, versus accidental? That is to say, is, is the expectation that the individual editor is going to become expert enough? To make those kind of decisions, I too have, have erred on the side of including everything, expecting yeah. that I'm going to go back through it, but also with this idea that someone else is going to look at it and yeah. help yeah. me make those judgments. But is that the wrong is that the wrong assumption to make? No one will probably look at the manuscript next to my MDA TV. The, ch the so chances are that, um, that all you'll get from your mentor and your two close readers and Alexander will be um, commentary saying whether or not you've laid it out correctly. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't really expect second readers to do the work again. Um, you could send sample sheets if you're anxious or you could send it to me. Um, but yeah, I mean basically what you're doing I think is providing a kind of storehouse of data which you can draw on in the introduction. And so you have to do the MDOTV in a sense before you can do the introduction because the introduction will use bits of MDOTV evidence to illustrate the, um, the history of the text, for example. The, uh, the one advantage we have, in my experience, with uh, all the novel manuscripts except uh, Bio bodies and put out more flags, which weren't available to me at the time, um, is it was is always very clear about what goes where. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that's that's a huge advantage. And in editing Bryson, I just put everything in. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's a lot of everything. Yeah, although it's sometimes a miracle that the typists manage to decipher it. <laughs> what, what the, but um, usually, with Brideshead, uh, with um, vile bodies, a uh, is is perfectly good. Would it be um, worth mentioning, Martin? I mean, we'll probably come back to it, but I've talked to Martin about the manuscript, which probably is a, an issue that many people have, um, has no enumeration by Evelyn Moore and doesn't have, understandably, a HRC enumeration. The only numbers are batches of manuscript papers, in fact on letter-headed note paper very often, batch one, batch two, batch three, sent to the typist. Mm -hmm. I've created, which I'd be very happy to show, I've brought it along with me, in TypeScript it's about four pages, simply a listing of page one of manuscript where I've had to give the number corresponds to this in UK one, uh, UK one, US one, UK two are all printed in fact oddly by the same printer, even US one they use the British printer. Um, and what I've been able to do then is actually the kind of issue where there's a major section that is in the manuscript but is transposed. In Rossetti's case, he has a piece about Roger Fry's aesthetic art theory that I think as a young man he's quite proud of. And it doesn't fit at the beginning where it is in the manuscript, but he moves it round and there's bits of it. And I've been able to use that listing very briefly, not only to show which page of the manuscript corresponds with which page of UK1, and eventually I think the OUP page, but also where chunks have been moved round. And that saved me a lot of space, and also the agony of, what do I do, just not mention this, even though it's your know, 12 lines that were on page 3 of the manuscript are on page 192 in the conclusion. Because it's also, for me, very significant 
that he's writing very fast, he's thinking as he writes, he's developing his own aesthetic theory as he writes, it does fit better at the end. It's just a bit bewildering at the beginning. He's obviously thought about it, but I don't think the reader would have got what he was trying to do if he'd left it where it was in the mm. manuscript. And that listing of page-by-page page manuscript has enabled me to deal with some of the things where I can briefly show. Okay. So, could I just ask... Uh, Come to you in a moment, Nigel. Um, is there another? Are there any other manuscripts that don't have pagination? Bryce has pagination as he's writing, sort of section by yeah. section. But he he numbered the final, you know, the, the gathering about the bound manuscript. He numbered separately. Right. So that I, is I've was gone with those numbers rather than trying yeah. to. Because he doesn't do that in Rossetti. Yeah. All that's, I've got that's is war's numbering. Yeah. I mean, consecutive numbering from beginning to end. That's war rather than the institution. Right. Post. Yeah. Post hoc. Yeah. 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 And that's it's just simplest simplest to refer to it in that way. Yeah. yeah. Because that's the way anybody who ever consults a manuscript will have to go. Yeah. Yeah. That's the real problem when he didn't do that, because right. in my no, case, a batch of 12 leaves have number one on, a batch of eight leaves have number two on, a batch of 20 leaves, it's just literally chunks sent to the typist, some of which are unfortunately misnumbered. I think there's two 22s, <laughs> 22, so I had to, and also the manuscript has stubs, and half pages and third pages right. that he'd actually written something, didn't like it, so he simply tore the bottom bit off. And I've had to create that. So without access to the manuscript, I, I'm conscious that the reader of the OUP edition is going to just have to take my word for it. But I'm hoping those few people that might be working on the manuscript in the HRC um, might be um, able to then find the passages that correspond. That's right. And so to go back to the earlier question, um, what, we're, what we're sort of trying to do here is to produce a tool for future yeah. scholars. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it needs to be usable. Um, so if the scholar of Rossetti um, wants to find his or her way about in the manuscript, then <coughs> Michael's uh, appendix will help him yeah. or her do it, that. It's become essential um, because I don't know all the manuscripts. Obviously, there's people that do know them all near enough, and I'm innocent in those. But he's working out how to write a book at a very fast pace, mm -hmm. the first one he's ever done, and he's chopping and changing. Also... Mm -hmm. Again, which I should mention, I think, because I've mentioned it in this listing, rather than what the heck do I do in substantive verbs. He's working so fast. He goes to um, Rossetti's brother's book on it. He obviously has a copy. He slices the pages out and sticks them into the manuscript page, making a few changes. His ink prose is above it and below it. And he's, he's working so fast. It's all properly done. Everything is quoted and put in footnotes. There's no plagiarism of any kind. But he's not even writing parts of Rossetti. He's cutting chunks out of books, which seems a bit no, I mean, vandal. <laughs> but that can be recorded okay. rather than substantive. we could come back to that, mm. because that will relate to um, laying out the quotation. Yeah, yeah. Right. No, I, I'm just... I mean, the question here about... Of course, there's a very pragmatic reason why they would draw a hard and fast line between um, effective, you know, substantive and accidental. In the full mass reproduction of uh, text, it would be voluminous yeah. to be able to record every small uh, spelling um, punctuation of difference than it just was would. My, my problem is the fact that, um, well, in, I'm as in Put Out More Flags, and it's quite clear that there's a different copy editor at work within the Chapman and Hall and then the, the American editions, because the stemmer runs yeah. quite, quite different in terms of punctuation, sometimes in terms of phrasing, but very, very rarely. And it seems to me that's worth, that's worth commemorating. <coughs> but that's worth recording. It can be done in an introductory note to the section. Yeah. Because my, know, my sometimes effort. the local instance is worth... Well, the Robbery Under Law US edition yeah. is almost Germanic in its <coughs> capitalisation. And I've made a long list of words, rather than trying to record every one of them, because it yeah. would, I tried to work, I did a sample, and I think I would have added about 30 pages of typescript 
just to record that president is lowercase uk1 uppercase and I gave a whole, I just collected the words and I put that the habit was this. Now, in my case, war, I know war had no dealings with it and refused to deal with any proofs or anything from the US edition, but it was worth recording because it gives a very different text. Simon? Yeah, the, the, the issue of, 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 since you mentioned the kind of number of pages of TypeScript there, that's, um, I, think, I think that is an issue. And in fact, it's, it's useful actually to, you know, to think about the implied reader of this edition, that, you know, that, yeah. that someone is going to be in. God, this, is, this is quite a worrying thought, actually. You know, ten years from now, someone will be, will be sat in, in HRC with the, with the manuscript of Decline and Fall and my edition. Checking your own yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Because, I mean, I, this, was, this was my question. I, I put it to start with, like, I'm, I'm, I'm really glad to hear we've got you know, a, kind of a lot of the same you know, problems or, or issues, too, is, is you know, I, I, I've just made a, a, you know, I've made a, made a, st a start. And recording everything, I, you know, to begin with, I recorded everything. And I thought, actually, I'm generating a large amount of very uninteresting information here. Um, and actually just thinking about, you know, what people will want to know. So, I mean, I've been making these kinds of judgment calls about, you know, so far, I'm in correspondence well, with Bob. It, it, um, you know, not, not recording, you know, differences in capitalization or punctuation, except for where they affect, say, a sentence structure. And that does seem to be, you know... Although, so. uh, in via bodies, capitalization... I mean, one of the things that the typist manages to get rid of, just because he left her to standardize things, really, <clears throat> so he's writing very fast, almost in a kind of shorthand sometimes, and he's completely careless about punctuation. Yeah. Um, it's not that he doesn't know how to do it properly, but he just can't be bothered. <clears throat> and he, he's going like a train, and so the typist just sort of standardizes everything, um, so that it would be acceptable to the printer. But along the way, one of the things that kind of gets standardised is humorous capitalisation. Uh -huh. um, mm. And uh, so, you know, if we were doing a conventional mm. editorial project, I'd be wanting to restore those, but we can't. But yeah. um, um, it's, it's, so it's, not, it's not the case. I mean, uh, I, I've been looking at, you know, various short stories um, which then appear in slightly amended in novels. Um, and uh, I'm aware that the short story version has not paid much attention to, and there's ample capitalization of people's ranks and that kind of thing. And in the novel version, uh, it's clearly um, not there. So it's been introduced by the um, printer of, of the, or the editor of the magazine. Oh, and it right. changes, radically changes the, the quality <coughs> of, of the text, as does a lot of addition, additional punctuation, yeah. because um, war is very light on punctuation. Mm. Well, um, I, would, I would just have to say at this stage, this is a really important point, I'll be dealing with it in my uh, paper this afternoon, yeah. if I can manage to get through it in 20 minutes. Um, but I think we have to be very clear that we are not producing a conventional um, editorial. Um, we're not, we haven't got a conventional editorial project whereby we can restore what we think to be better readings from pre-publication material, for example. We have to just publish UK1 and record anything and, and only change things which are nonsense. Only change things which are nonsense. But there is record everything else. Of course you record it. But you don't change it in UK one. Um, um, if we don't all agree about that, which is the basis of the whole kind of editorial <laughs> principles, <coughs> we're in trouble. Um, so we must we must agree about that because we've um, started. Sorry to come back at, at you about that, but in the uh, um, in the guidance to editors, there was an established there was established a distinction between. Um, things that were published um, in papers, newspapers and journals and so yeah. on, and the um, published texts of um, fiction or collections of short stories. That's true. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and if there is a, a manuscript um, that lies behind a, a, a magazine publication, yeah. then... Um, I, I think that's fair enough. Yeah. Then you give yeah. preference to the you manuscript. Could, you could print the manuscript, yeah. yeah. And I think that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, okay. But 
you would have to, you would print the manuscript as it stood. Yes. Yeah, not changing course. that. No, um, yes. And then record all the differences. Yeah. And then record what how it appears in the magazine. Yeah. 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 And then one could just say in a single sentence that there are a lot of computerized yeah. capitalizations which yeah. are not there in the manuscript. Right. Yeah. So in, in some ways um, the case of the um, short work is, is different from from the books. Yeah. Uh, in that respect, <clears throat> um, and also in respect, I remember you, you were the person, when you, Anne, who raised the interesting question of white lines. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, would you like to say something about that? I mean, because you, uh, I mean, I've got the same problem, Yes. Um, but it would well, be that's interesting to hear. Off, because Martin raised this problem at one of the editorial board, in, board meetings. Um, in, frequently, in um, Moore's manuscript, certainly the fictional ones, I don't know about the non-fiction, he will introduce in an italicized script with a sloping square bracket, white line. Or a space one line. Oh, sorry, white yeah. space, I beg your yeah. oh, I think he says no, white line. Sometimes, white it's, sometimes it's white line yeah. and sometimes he, in Vile Bodies he writes space one line. Ah, oh, well, yeah. okay. He, he it's the same thing. He evolved yeah. a technique. Yeah. Um, and there is a real problem about this because um, they often get lost in successive publications, um, or even in the first one. And equally, I think um, I'm finding that they get lost in my electronic text. And they are as an essential way um, in which war punctuates a narrative. It's a smaller fragment than a numbered section or a, a chapter or a part. But like it has cutting a, in film. It's like cutting in film. It's like bar, double bar lines in music. It's it's uh, like stanzas, spaces right. in a poem. It's essential. Um, I'm concerned that this shouldn't get lost in the whole of our, our project. Um, and I wondered whether we should have some system of recording those white lines in our electronic text mm -hmm. so that they are preserved mm -hmm. and can then be reproduced in the printed text as well. Um, and it's an open question. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Is that... <laughs> no, no, no. It's <coughs> but again, I would say that the the case for the, um, the shorter pieces where war had no control over the printed text <coughs> is different from the case where he did have control mm -hmm. over the printed text. Theoretically, at least, he was reading proofs and he was seeing different editions through the press. Mm. Now, I gave... Uh, I'm very sympathetic to this because I feel you know, one of our um, research questions, if you like, um, is to try to uh, establish or re-establish war as a modernist writer mm. in his early days. Yeah. <coughs> and he's very interesting and experimental and the white line cross-cutting cinematic mm -hmm. thing is very important to how he orchestrates <coughs> the text. <coughs> However, now, I gave one example in the handbook of where a white line was clearly misplaced. And uh, this was a typing error. Uh, 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 I think it was a printer's error rather than a typing error. Um, but the, what had happened was that the last line of a concluding section had been detached from it and stuck onto the first line <laughs> beneath the white line. So it made no sense at all. So on the grounds that it produces nonsense, I'm happy to restore that white line. However, much as I would like to um, restore the other white lines that go missing, um, sometimes because uh, the typist uh, uh, coincidentally reaches a white line at the bottom of a TypeScript page. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> um, because War oversaw proofs, and oversaw the various editions where these white lines have gone, I don't think I can restore those. Um, so you know, what we've got, if, if we were to, to restore you know, the points at which he'd marked up in the manuscript, space one line, um, then we have a problem because we'd be, as it were, giving the manuscript primacy rather than UK one. Um, 
And I, 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 it goes against the grain with me in a sense because I did start off as a traditional textual editor and I still quite like the idea of, you know, um, of a melded text where you've got a better text, as it were. But I don't think, according to our editorial principles for the books, we can do that. But we can record it. We can record, yes, yeah, of course. And that, yeah. I mean, that's, yeah. that's important, isn't but it? But you, you would record it in the MDA? Yeah. yeah. Yes. But and we um, would talk about it in the introduction. Yes. And we would say, isn't it a picture that this has gone missing? But we can't yeah. actually restore it to the text. Okay. But um, then um, the second problem uh, is actually the initial problem, which is how we make sure that it's, um, it, it survives in our electronic text. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, how and what? Well, uh, these white lines yeah. um, need to be correctly <coughs> reproduced in the electronic text. Yeah. Um, I find that my electronic text slides around from page to page. Uh, oh, I see. that's what you mean by electronic text, right? Yes. I mean the one in the um, the one in the repository, repository which yeah. will then become the printed text. Right. Yeah. But um, I assume that most people will be accessing it in a um, an ele electronic form, ultimately, won't they? Well, I think w w we just do our best with it. I mean, if the repository um, allows the text to slide around and then when we make the necessary alterations it reconfigures itself somehow, then that has to be something... I mean, AUP's people would have to talk about this. But it's going this, to add enormously to everybody's proof correcting if, um, if the, there is no indication to the repository that this is... Um, a white line rather than just the bottom of the page. Right. Well, you can you can add notes to that. So with, uh, suggesting to the printer, you've already done this. I've you? used a <coughs> square bracket, capital E, capital D, colon, add, and I've put an instruction. In my case, it's not white lines, but in fact prose that requires specific lineation, and that can slip. And I put it in red, yeah. and this will eventually have to be deleted. But I'm taking a print out of this, so I will have a paper copy as well, saying that I've got to double check. They're almost reminders to myself yeah. that in your case, this line space is here. In my case, this lineation has not been standardized by OUP. Okay. And so there will be a bit of work. But I think using my habit is read, because as we'll come on to, we've been indenting very yeah. long quotations, over 50 words. In several cases, mine cover pages because you cut bits out of books. But I put it all in red at the moment. And I think that would be very easy to explain to OUP I've done this with other editions, with other publishers, that this is just to make sure we both talk from the same hymn sheet, so to speak. Well, wouldn't it be a good, a good idea if that was a <coughs> established practice for all of us? This, I mean, this yeah. is really crucial, Anne, because I've just done this, and, uh, and your question has made me think I'm going to have to go back to the... Because what I did, I printed out the electronic text to check, yeah. as I was doing the... to check the BT yeah. version. And actually, the spacing between lines, not not only including where there's a white line, is is um, is uneven, yeah. um, and that means I need to go back and check the white line issue, but also check what's going on with that spacing. Well, are you um, just talking about ordinary text that yeah, spacing yeah. is? Well, I'm, I think that'll work itself out. Yeah, when, when it's, it's, but, but, but I, th I think yes. yeah. I think there is an issue there that I mean I'm would like to talk to AUB because I toot my Rossetti text to our IS specialists and part of that they are convinced is scanned. Now this may be wrong but there are scanning codes in the text I have and we went into the full properties, we looked at them. The only issue Barbara could resolve it for me is when I indented 12 lines it would also indent the previous and the yes. following paragraph. Mm -hmm. And I found that if I reversed on it, it would then just retain the part I indented. And that's a characteristic quality of scanned text, which I think has been very thoroughly vetted and checked. I only found one or two what I'd call typos. Mm -hmm. um, but the thing that I think is useful, because I have done this quite a lot in Renaissance editing, is square brackets, ED in capitals, colon, and then whatever you want to say means on a global search, you and OUP typesetters can immediately find every ED and work through them systematically. In your case, to double check that the lineation or the white spaces are correct. In OUP's version, to take out the ED instruction. And you know, I've sometimes put probably between 50, 100, even more in a text 
for an OUP setter, it takes about 10 minutes to take them out. And it also means they can't do it globally because there's words following ED. Um, I have had, I think Martin knows the issue, where a global collection in an OUP work, they corrected one letter I and they globally took out all the I's mm. in a folding and they had to recall the entire edition, an £80 volume, and reprint at their expense. So I'm a bit of a bête noire for OUP. <laughs> but that sense of putting in ED makes me mechanically go through them because if you do global search they will all come up and you can click on it and go one by one but it, I also use red because in my printout I've got that in front of me and I found that absolutely essential. Yeah. I think there is something in the handbook now about this because we had quite a discussion with OUP about what state they wanted the text presented in <coughs> and um, they, 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 they Quite generously, they just sort of suggested ballpark things. So it has to be clear what's a heading, what's a subheading, what's a quotation, you know, all this kind of thing. Because um, the problem was, well, uh, you know, no matter how we set it up, surely they're going to just redo it all for house style. Um, and uh, we were hoping that Jacqueline might come today and, and talk to us about the progress they've made with the design of house style. Um, and maybe Alexander knows a bit about this, but Jacqueline sadly is ill, so uh, we don't know. Rachel should be coming, so um, we'll see what she has to say. But, but basically, but what we're, you know, this, this is all new, you know, we're kind of making it up as we go along. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we've got a good, very solid, basic framework, but there are issues like this which will come up all the time, and so that handbook will change on the... Uh, and we'll inform you if there are changes, of course, but the, the handbook which is on the website will change as these policy things develop. Speaking of OUP, and this is jumping ahead, I'm, I'm aware, uh, what is the role of their editorial board once our editorial board has turned over uh, electronic text to them? So could you how much that? how much vetting are they going to do? <coughs> After it's com well, I mean there's there's this kind of three stage process, isn't it? Okay, which everybody knows about. So you've got your mentor who right. should be looking at it very carefully, <coughs> who then signs it off when he or she's happy that um, you're following all the protocols mm -hmm. and and also you know, certain kinds of things. I was making suggestions for you contracting some of the narrative of the footnotes and so on. Little things usually, but you know, just with a good eye for detail. And then once that's signed off, it goes to two close readers. Once that's signed off, it goes to Alexander for final approval. Um, so really, once it's gone beyond, uh, well, once it's in, the, this is a kind of process in itself. So all the editorial board does, in a sense, is to decide who the mentors and second readers are going to be, <coughs> and it goes ahead on its own, and it's your negotiations with those various parties. Right. Um, so the editorial board won't suddenly kind of look at something and say, good God, you know, <laughs> we can't have this. Um, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, got, it's gone through a very mm -hmm. thorough quality control process. So OUP is not going to come in and spill all the apples on the road? Well, we don't know, of course, um, <coughs> um, because sometimes OUP kind of promise things which they can't really deliver. Um, but um, it's... Um, a, the only thing I could think of that, that, that in terms of apples on the road would be um, that they might say... Um, your MDA TV is far too long. Um, uh, this, is, this is no longer an economic <laughs> proposition. Um, so, but we've all signed contracts in which we've given word counts. So if you operate within that word count, then it should be okay. And if you want um, exemption from that in the light of actually doing the work, you find you need much more space to do this properly. It has to be done properly, obviously, otherwise there's no point in doing it. Right. Um, then, uh, you know, by all means, get back to us and the editorial board would, would back you on that. 
Um, whether or not OUP would agree to it is another matter, but we, you know, as an editorial board, we would be keen to see the best possible. But they one. will, as I understand you, they will not do further editing at OUP, is that correct? No. The no. one thing, Martin, I would mention is that I've just had sadly dealing with the problem of a very good copy editor, this is another publisher, two volumes of collections of essays. The first one which he copy edited to a very high standard, but to the in-house publisher standard because the publishers did not send to him the editorial standards, the equivalent of our editor's handbook. And we have re-copy edited 300 plus pages of very basic things such as capitalization of Psalms of David when the word Psalms was used he'd put lowercase and the standard right through was not to do that the second volume he's done very well to conforming to it and I think the editorial team the hierarchy must liaise with OUP to make sure that no copy editor which OUP as I would understand anything I've done for them does have a copy editor yeah. one or two of them I know as friends yeah. and one is very good and I would ask for it tends to work on scientific things but it's very exact but they can only work on what OUP send to them yeah. and if they don't have what the editorial <coughs> thing, uh, standards are there will be problems yeah, because they, really they can intervene and the thing I think that really matters is that um, the senior editorial board are in touch with OUP and them but also the editor of the volume is able to explain to the copy editor what is happening, which, if nothing else, I find sets up an email interchange between the copy editor and the volume editor, because this problem we had shouldn't have arisen, but sadly it did, and I felt very sorry for the work the copy editor had put in, because everything he'd done was right in terms of the in-house style, but we'd previously agreed with the commissioning editor this is the way this was going to be done. Yeah. And you can get slippages like that that's probably caused us yeah, about two months' work. That's a really good point, because I mean, you, you kind of assume that OUP, of course, would hand the copy editor the handbook and the editorial principles, but it may, you know, can happen that yeah. the, well, that's not the case. So <laughs> we need to make sure that um, when we get to that stage, which we're quite relatively close to now with your book, um, that, mm. that, that sets a precedent, you know, so that the, the copy editor knows. Yeah. Should I raise my issue mark here of the, um, the ellipsis? Yeah. Because I think it seems related to Anne's question about the white lines, because it's not, um, I think, what Barbara said, Bob, was related to what you've done in, in, in Brideshead, was to standardise in the rekeyed re re version to the standard that's used in UK1. Yeah. Um, I think you don't have spaces either side of your three dots, and it lists you mid-sentence. I do in my UK1, but I think if it was obviously standardised in that respect, because the wiki file is not standardised in that respect. Yeah. Um, no. It's quite inconsistent. No. Yeah. I, I haven't got an absolute answer to this, um, other than to say um, yeah, one response would be just follow UK1. Um, but following UK1 is not standard, but with UK1's uh, procedure for ellipses is not standard procedure now. So, for instance, if you, if you have um, uh, three suspension dots and a full stop, <coughs> those are all joined together. Yeah. Mm. Um, and then there's a space and then a new sentence starts. Um, well, these days, I think we would have a full stop, a space, three suspension dots, mm -hmm. space, mm -hmm. and then the capital letter. Um, uh, I think really this is a question of what OUP wants as its house style. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and then when they've come to a decision on that, then they, they can alter that. You, know, you don't need to go all the way, surely, do we? Go through, all through the text looking for suspension well, dots. Surely they're cast to down. <laughs> <laughs> and and Morris is not um, consistent in his own practice either, so no. it, um, it is very variable. Yeah. One thing that might help Martin is again this problem we had, we resolve by the process once, so to speak, the editor thinks they've done all they can, is that we sent in Word files, the Word files were sent to the copy editor, the copy editor did work on them, and then we, as volume editors, because, it, as I say, a collection of essays, in track changes on the Word file, 
put in any corrections and amended the text, or very often commentary, if there's something very irregular that we want ellipsis preserved like this here, but differently here. Mm -hmm. And then they went back. The typesetter eventually sent us first proofs in PDF, where they asked, we didn't do post-it notes or whatever on PDF. They have a form where you list page and line and what correction. And that seems to have worked very well. But Mm -hmm. I would struggle on Rossetti, I think, without having a post-copy edited word text that I can't actually put track changes on because the in-house editor, certainly the other publisher I'm working with now, Ashgate, had no problem at all. This is their preferred way. When I sent my track changed word text back, which commented on the work of the copy editor as well and made any final points, they then produced the PDF from that without any problem at all. And the PDF became the first proof. And I think that's a much safer way. Okay. Yeah. I think it's very useful because what you. Sorry. One little thing that disturbed me uh, when we were going to do the uh, correct the typos on the repository, I asked somebody, I think it might have been Rachel about whether it would be wise to correct to OUP style at the same time in a very basic way with simply S's to Z's where necessary and italicised titles because, you know, over the various articles in one place it's done in quotes, in another it's italicised, and a couple of other small points like that. Mm. And I said, <laughs> It, I, I couldn't contemplate, though, changing for the Oxford comma. <laughs> yes, I remember this. Oh, it's so yeah. idiosyncratic in yes. its uh, punctuation that I think it would really violate its text to mm. correct to the Oxford comma. Mm. But I've got a rather snooty reply to yes, that. Really. <laughs> so <laughs> we'll attend to that when the time comes. This is our comma. Um, the, the, uh, what is the Oxford comma? <laughs> Just it, an extra comma you don't expect it. Uh, that was is it a comma before and? Yeah. Yeah. In lists, you've got to have and, and with a comma before it. Mm. Mm. Yes. Yeah. 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 But, I mean, if we go back to sort of editorial fundamentals mm. here, you're in the same position as yeah. Anne. Yeah, because, very much. Yeah. yeah because you're dealing with short pieces over which War had no control of the printed text, really. Um, he wouldn't have seen proofs or anything like that. So you're, you're at liberty, I think, to change, um, uh, 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 to introduce any improved readings from any manuscript that you've got, or type, well, typescript or whatever. You know. Well, I have no manuscripts to deal with, really. I have a couple of typescripts. Right. But they were submitted to journals um, as samples of his work, hoping, you know, for employment on this sort of paper, but yeah. they were never printed. Yeah. So I, I don't have the manuscript versus printed text or right. typescript. Right. Uh, Lucky you. Problem. <laughs> <laughs> but I do have the problem of quite a lot of. Annotation is your yeah, problem. Well, annotation yeah. and also slightly wrongly printed words, you know, yeah. type, type of. Yeah. I mean, again, I'll talk about this very briefly this afternoon, but I think um, if we're thinking about um, the idea that we can only change things where the UK one reading produces an absurdity, we then have to ask the question what constitutes an absurdity? Mm. And I think a misspelling is an absurdity. And particularly, I mean, Michael's got some very interesting examples of this, where mm. war gets the names of painters and, and yes. gen- yeah. people generally yeah. wrong. Yes. Um, and it's very important that we correct those, I think, mm. rather than just simply reproducing the mistake. Otherwise, your index will be nonsensical, because exactly. I will have web <coughs> and wells. Under wells, it will say C-web. 
except the text would retain Wells, even though the guy's name was Webb. <laughs> Therefore, they've got to be changed. I mean, we spent a lot of time discussing these. And yeah. Yeah. Wall was a very good reviser, but he was a lousy proofreader. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. I think we, that's we, crucial. We because, back and yeah. forth on uh, closed lids and closed yeah. lips. Yeah. Uh, and the lips <laughs> makes no sense at all. And not, not even Anthony Blanche had a perversion that would... Yeah. That, yeah. Now, your examples were very interesting, weren't they? Because I thought one was okay to change and one probably wasn't because it wasn't right. Yeah. Um, so maybe at some, we'll have to finish, I think, but at some stage you could bring that back up and, and we could talk about your particular examples. Um, is there, we're out of time, but is there anything anybody wants to say before we break? What was the political yes, political. Sorry. What, tell political. us about the last heading. Or are you being politically not Oh, political editing. I think it might have been, would it be um, about, um, or at least Michael's got a very interesting example of it, where the American edition of Robbery Under Law is, is uh, yeah. heavily censored or changed in some it, ways. I mean, it may be other <coughs> points as well, but in my case, the US-1 text of Robbery Under Law has no authority at all because there is documentary evidence in the correspondence of war with his agent that he had nothing whatsoever to do with it. However, in the introduction, but also in some of the textual variants, there are some very interesting excisions which make Robbery Under Law an unacceptable title, which becomes Mexico an object lesson, removing the, um, I think, problems that the American publishers clearly saw if they retained some of War's comments about their ambassadorial dealings in Mexico. But some also have to be contained because the American editor gets the names wrong of some of the American um, political figures. <laughs> Therefore, you know, there's a crossover between... I, I should say that what might be helpful is, in both Rossetti and Robbery Under Law, I had very rough drafts of the introductory material before I did the textual annotations and I was constantly feeding back into the introduction relevant things from the textual annotations that saved me a great deal of space in the textual annotations such as this because I was stuck with the problem of US 1 should have no significance at all to my editing because war had nothing to do with it but it's one of the most interesting points about robbery under law. Yeah. It does raise a really interesting, I mean I kind of think, I don't know if you've done this, <laughs> um, you ought to record those variants. Um, well, they are, but briefly, and then though, they, yeah. even though War wasn't responsible for them, because his name was on the book, and yes. right. yeah. yeah, and and anybody who's using the original <coughs> edition needs to know. Hmm. Yeah. Well, what, what, no, what I've actually done, to, again, because we must be economical in this particular section, is I've used the standard of the opening words, the closing words, and the dots yeah, in the right. textual variants, yeah. but the introduction, because I kept finding them and thinking... God, I've got to quote all of that. It's so interesting. It's explosive. They are the texts are in the introduction of what was removed. Um, so that's why I made the point of having a rough introduction first. I kept finding things when I did the textual collation, as I'd call it, to put in the introduction, which I wouldn't have realised because although I'd read Robbery Under Law, I hadn't been aware of the differences between the UK text and the US text. If I if I could just. Before we finish, touch on the. Sorry, right. Do we not have until 11 for this session? Sorry. Do we not have until 11 o'clock? Oh, do we? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, we've got no time. Um, let's go on to. The, well, are there any questions about about what's been said so far before we? I just asked. I'm at the very beginning. I'm the volumist of the Black Mystery Quiz. Does anybody know if there was any political editing that? So. Bob? I'm Was there any political editing of Black Mischief in the way that um, uh, Robbie Underlaw was had? Not to my knowledge, <coughs> but I don't think I collated when I was doing, uh, even while writer, the uh, British and American editions. I was talking just about the growth of the text and primarily the, uh, uh, in the case of Black Mischief, the, uh, the manuscript. And I don't, I don't know. The, I, I think the question of political correctness <coughs> had not arisen as much in 1932 <laughs> uh, as it did subsequently. Yeah. Uh, you know, if you're going to be politically correct, you just expunge the whole novel. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
Oh, you <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I can't quite remember what they are, but there are some differences between the manuscript and UK one in the racially charged language in decline and fall. I think he may have toned it down slightly. I think yeah. in, in subsequent versions after after the first one, but um, I'm afraid I'm I, ha I haven't got that far in my work this year. I'm thinking back to the, the work I was doing last summer, but um, not political editing so much as self censorship or war reigning it in a bit. Um, I mean, th this is the kind of thing, of course, that we want to generate generally on the project, where there's kind of cross-fertilisation mm -hmm. of ideas. Mm -hmm. So, um, do you use the website to exchange ideas, ask questions like this, mm -hmm. you know, so we can get it out there amongst the community of scholars? And, and I think this is something that we're doing differently from previous editions. I mean, obviously people have always talked by email, well, not always, but, you know, yeah. uh, or mail. Uh, and, uh, but we have the ability now to talk to each other pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and for other people to pitch in as well, you know, so it's not just a, a one to one. Okay, let's just move on then to this um, laying out of quotations because this is another issue that arose from the editing of Rossetti. And um, it, the, the problem was, I'll leave Michael to talk, it, talk you through it, but the problem <coughs> was that there was. Um, uh, we, what Michael's described of wars cutting great lumps out of books and pasting them in. A lot of practice we probably advise for our students, but. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, <coughs> he, Did uh, have to it in. <laughs> <laughs> so you can, you can get quotations of extraordinary length, and actually you don't realise, well, I think you tend to forget when you're reading the book, that each new paragraph is beginning with inverted commas. So it does kind of read a bit like his own work, but anyway, mm -hmm. as you say, it's all clearly identified with um, quotation marks. Um, but the problem was, uh, well, this, this, this is an AUP house style thing, mm -hmm. they said when this arose, well, we're not going to do that. Um, not going to do what? We're going to start each new paragraph with, um, with inverted commas in the way that they did in 1928. Um, what we, you know, so we suggested that's a good indent. So, do you want to take it from there? Yeah. I mean, the problem, as Martin explained, came up that there are very long quotations in Rossetti, some literally cut out of books, and when I've got the AMS, it's very easy to spot those and so on and so forth. But also, he quotes at great length in his own manuscript writing. Um, and 1928 UK1, um, and as I should say, UK2 and US1 are all printed by the same printers. So they're all impressions, actually, they're not editions, um, apart from preliminaries. Open each new paragraph with a quotation mark. They don't use a closing quotation mark, but you can constantly see through the text that these are quotations. OUP wouldn't be happy doing that. So what was agreed, which is standard OUP policy, that quotations over 50 words would be indented. This is where I. Then you the non-fiction. Yeah, <laughs> non. Sorry, that should say yeah. non-fiction. What that mm. then created was, um, I mean, a fair amount of work. But I, in some ways, it's just another level of checking the text and going over it time and time again. Mm. But what I found was technically, and this is where I went over to my own ISS department when I indented the, um, shall we say, 350-word quotation it pulled a whole section of the text over. Yeah. And then I went you know, on Word where you can reverse the operation. It kept the indent, but put the others back. And that's why I think the scanning codes, if they are right, I mean, I'm not that expert, but they were very definite, are affecting it. And it can be easily remedied, but we need to be aware of it. Because if you indent a quotation on the text I've got anyway, and I've tried um, you know, every part of Rossetti, I've done the whole thing, it pulled more than the passage I wanted to indent over, so you had to go back and correct. Um, but then by indenting them, in my own working digital text and my printout, I've kept every indent in red, because it just makes me double check them all the time. That worked fine, except it then meant there was, I think, quite radical intervention with punctuation, because UK1 would often introduce a long quotation without any form of indentation or a new line. There could be a comma, there could be a colon, there could be a dash. Um, and I've, we agreed that we would introduce indented quotations 
with the colon, which is one of the issues I raise because, you know, are we happy with this? Is OUP aware that we were having minimal intervention if we can? But that's a very major intervention in a text. I've added many colons, and I've still one example that sometime over the weekend I'm going to show to Martin, which in this case I've marked up in blue, because what we've actually got is a very long quotation where it's got dashes right through. Some of the dashes are original to the quotation, as Rossetti's brother said, dash, but some of them then, the next dash is Evelyn War interpolating his own comment on that particular quotation, and then the quotation carries on. And do I remove these dashes? Do I put colons? It's a very tricky example. But by and large, most of it would work, I think, mm. where I've in some cases replaced commas that allowed quotations just to run on the line. Or some of them, there's no punctuation at all. A new line started for the quotation, none of which are indented in UK1, but would require under OUP standards colon to introduce and then the indent. The indent makes it very clear it's a full quotation. And as we've noted in some cases, in the OUP text, the quotation will run probably over three or four pages because it's a whopping great piece of text that War literally cut out of his printed source, mm -hmm. stuck in, and then in fact made some editorial emendations as you and I might on a printed typescript or proof. So they've got to be recorded in the textual variants. Um, but it, it was quite a major mm. stage in dealing with the text. And then, of course, OUP will be looking at this text, and we must brief the copy editors, because as my recent experience shows, very experienced copy editors will very rapidly standardise to OUP in-house. But that example where there's dashes of both... The original quotation has dashes, but Evelyn War, because it was all continuous prose in UK 1, uh, 1928, is interpolating his own rather wry comments on it with dashes as well. Mm. Makes it very difficult to determine what is a 50 line, a 50 mm. word or more quotation, mm. because this section is about 150 words, but it could be subdivided into 12 words. Mm. Um, 30 words and so on. So it's a tricky it, it, process. There was another kind of problem, wasn't there, where you <laughs> have um, typically um, a, a, the opening of a quotation uh, and then, you know, as William Michael Rossetti said, yeah. and then the quotation carrying on for a couple of pages. Um, <clears throat> but I think we can just get around that, can't we, by yeah. sticking the colon after yeah. said. He had a very <coughs> common habit of... Um, Rossetti is a genius, comma, as William Michael Rossetti, his brother, said, and we decided that that's where the colon would go. In other words, the very short quotation would stand within the body of the yeah. previous paragraph and the interpolation by war, and then the colon, and then the much lengthier indented quotation. But again, that's quite an important yeah. editorial and it, interpolation. And it is, you know, I mean, you could imagine somebody saying in a review, uh, this completely alters the look of the book, uh, because you realise immediately how much is lifted from secondary sources, which is disguised, really, in the, um, in the original. Although every one of them has a footnote. Sure. Oh, absolutely. Um, if, if Evelyn War had been an MA or PhD <coughs> student, Rossetti would pass exactly, but you might recommend that keep your quotations shorter. <laughs> There's no plage. I mean, it, it will work yourself. Yeah, it, it's quite striking <laughs> that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the same problem occurs with uh, PIB, which I've also but, used. Yeah. So what he primarily tends to do, I think, is. Uh, paraphrase and spice up, you know, so he makes the writing a bit livelier, but it, the paragraph after paragraph uh, direct takes out of Holman Hunt's book yeah, right. as revised by yeah. his uh, yeah. widow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I could comment on that because we've, you, you've been very kind to me in helping with that, but the little pamphlet that War wrote and was privately printed and published PRB, pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, he certainly had that open on his desk, so to speak, when he was writing various sections. What I've tried to do, in addition to the AMS, because recording every minute variant in PRB and UK1 
create something that's a bit too artificial, I think, for that. But I have a section of my introduction where I've actually quoted chunks from PRB and then I've quoted the parallel chunk from Rossetti UK1, but I've put in bold where Evelyn War has made emendations. And that, I think, is reason. Martin's seen that, is reasonably clear to the reader, because I think, apart from you and I, probably there aren't many people in the world that want to know every textual variant between PRB and Rossetti. But I think all readers of the edition of Rossetti and PRB will want to know just how much he reused PRB. But um, he has a very striking quotation about Turner. And for me it's important, because in PRB it's a striking quotation, he tunes it up even more in Rossetti. And this great genius sinking like the setting sun and Etty, you know, the great painter of nudes, stumbling into the Royal Academy. And he tunes up the comic elements, even though it's obviously with respect. Um, but the use of bold there, which again I discussed with Martin in the introduction, seemed to give the reader a flavour of how he amended PRB and basically copied it out, but edited his own writing to sort of tune it up into a more distinctively warish style. I mean, one, one of the things that I think, I think actually you come to a very useful, pragmatic solution to the problems that your individual text has thrown out. Mm -hmm. And of course that means you're being alert to it, and alert therefore in terms of the communication that's necessary between yourself and OUP, in terms of any dislocation between what you've represented in good faith and the house style which might erase or alter some of those yeah. things. But maybe you know, under the radar, Right? It might be that I reproduce something and put out more flags, and then suddenly at the proof stage, I find that in fact house style has altered what I have put in there, and in good faith, I try and alter back what is in fact inalterable back to what I gave, you know, handed over to well, OUP. It shouldn't be inalterable. I mean, it shouldn't be a problem. It, if it's a question of punctuation. Um, well, it but it's, it, it, anything that changes pagination will be inalterable. And that's another issue, actually, yeah. which we might talk about, because the original conception of the project was that we should move to, because we were changing very, very little, we could move to effectively proof copy with uh, the final pagination quickly right. for the books. <coughs> Although you'd be unhappy with this, I think, um, because they... <coughs> They're anxious that changes will be made that will change pagination. Um, they might have some reason for it. I mean, but it, what, the original idea was that we, we would get to this stage much more quickly than a conventional editing process would allow. And then we could all cross refer to the final pagination uh, and do it like that. And we'd have the whole lot up there. <coughs> um, whether OUP are willing to do that, I don't know anymore. That, that Martin, does go back to my point that on Rossetti, um, and having worked off and on quite a lot with OUP, they're very fast moving once you get to copy editing stage and yeah. the schedules of this must be done in three, four weeks, otherwise you know, you're doomed and the book will never be published. Yeah. And they're a big concern, they've got to do that. But if we don't have a system where we submit Word files, the copy editor works on them, but sends word files back that we can put track changes on before we get to PDF proofs, we will have problems mm. because the indentation process well, has created example. something that OUP mm. will, for the first time, mm. the copy editor will be looking at. But I'm very conscious that OUP will almost certainly be using a multiplicity of copy editors yeah. mm. on a project of this size. Um, one of the best ones I personally know, you know, we went to school together, works largely on scientific stuff. Mm. Um, and that sense of the risk of the text changing, and then we're actually, I would even say, stuck with, fri with fixed pages, mm. um, is something that, as far as I'm aware, has never been done before. No. This is so radical that we're going to have an electronic text that's fixed and everyone can cross-refer. That's a phenomenal thing to pick up. Um, and to make that work. But we, we've got, I think, with OUP talk, the stages of where the volume editor still has a say in important issues of layout that you and I obviously have had very long discussions about how to do Rossetti, and we could find a very professional, well-intentioned copy editor radically changes something right through. 
and we've got to check that. Even little points, as you know, another point was coming up, if OUP standardises S's to Z's in their spelling, I've got to proofread the entire text of Rossetti again, because UK1 uses S's. Mm. And that's something we've got to address, because we've never told our editors so far, as you go through the digital text, change it to Z. I mean, the very basic problem, oh, oh, issue here, surely, is that this is... Uh, scholarly edition. It's not just an ordinary book that we're submitting for printing to be mucked about with by copy editors. Uh, copy editors mustn't touch it. I mean, in the sense that we you know, we've spent thousands of hours you know, recording the idiosync idiosyncrasies of these texts. <coughs> and um, if, if, if S is not said, it should stay S is in my view. Yeah. I mean, we've got to be very blunt, what we've got to work out, because I have done a little research on this, in what OUP pay their copy editors, uh, compared to what OUP perhaps you know, have to pay them, compared to, in fact, having a couple of years ago done a book, very large, complicated one, with the American Philosophical Society, who produced the best copy editing I've ever come across. Mm. It was superb. The person doing it was paid approximately twice as much as OUP rates. Mm. Yeah. So surprising. these people are earning a living. <coughs> They've got to actually get through the work and get yeah, it yeah. back and the next one comes. Yeah. And I think yeah. we must be very alert to that because this isn't just a monograph you and I, any of us happen to have written on war and would like it standardised. It's going to be something very different. Yeah. I, I would have an argument to take to OUP and say, can they assign just a couple of editors? I mean, they wouldn't be able to give all the work to one person, or possibly even two, but if we, if we make the argument that it's exactly those terms, that it's not just a standard book, and it will actually save them time if they familiarise themselves with the handbook, to then be used, two or three of them, a stable of, of copy editors used on this edition. That would be um, ideal, yeah. Um, They're unlikely to get more than two or three volumes a year, I thought, anyway. So. Yeah, but that, if, it, if it was about saving them money and making sure that it didn't, there didn't have to be endless changes once it goes back to us before the PDF stage, mm. then that, that would be the way, you know, yeah. money no, is the key to that. It would be very nice if we had a kind of, as it were, in-house copy editor who was au fait with the project, yeah. Oh, I just think about the timetable. I mean, if, if we're working to get his handbook, and his handbook is available to OUP now, yeah. therefore the copy of it is should be working to get his handbook. And if there's a problem about some kind of dislocation between that and OUP has style, then it's an argument that can happen now. Yeah. In other words, because <laughs> that's, you know, we're both good. We're not yeah. arguing about where we're heading. Mm. We know where we're heading. That would be something the editorial board would, would uh, before try to Before we do. wind up, I'm curious about the HRC numbering, which I think is the one thing we haven't touched on. Okay, go on. Uh, what's the issue? <laughs> uh, sorry. The the you, oh, I'm sorry. Right. <laughs> who, who raised this? Someone asked me to put it on the slide this morning. I think it partly relates to the fact that some <laughs> manuscripts at the HRC have numeration right through. Oh, oh, Rosetti oh. has none, ah, the point okay, I raised before, okay. so I've had to make, <coughs> I mean I might show so it to you, I'd be interested in your really comment, so. Yeah, uh, that uh, I've had to number the manuscript, you know, Brennan's numbering, to make it <coughs> usable to correspond to right. UK1 readings and so on and so forth. Can I, can I just jump back to laying out quotations because <coughs> I may have misunderstood the discussion we had in the editorial board. Um, in fiction, um, there are moments when a character has a speech of more than one paragraph. Yeah. And then you have the initial inverted commas and not the final one yeah. until that speech is complete. And in one short story, it actually means it's the most of the short story. <coughs> but we should keep that punctuation. I think we should, yes. yes. Mm. Oh, that's fine. And <laughs> although you might need to make this case absolutely clear to AUP, and bring it to the editorial well, board, yes. um, so that we've got chapter and verse on it for future. I can, I can do the um, <coughs> in red highlights. Um, yeah, I don't. I don't think we want to start indenting. The no, no, no. Dialogue. Absolutely not. Yeah. It makes nonsense no. of the text. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. only just that. It's a, yeah, excessively long quotations. And, um, and, it's it, and it's quotations in non non fiction. Yeah, it's a non fiction. Mm -hmm. okay. I, I think that's. I think that's that's crucial. Actually, just thinking about. 
you know, what might be the editorial principle that, you know, that underlies those kinds of decisions? Because, um, you know, when someone is writing a history of the reception of the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood in 10 years' time, you would like them to be using your edition of Evelyn Wall's book on Rossetti, wouldn't you? So, you know, that, that is kind of part of the implied reader. And I was, I was thinking also when you were talking about correcting the proper names in, um, in Robbery Under Law, that, that with the addition of um, Gissing's book on Dickens that I did with Pierre Coustias, uh, we, well, I say we, he, Pierre did almost all the work on that book. Um, you know, Gissing wrote that book in Italy, um, where, he, where he was wintering, and he, he quotes Dickens from memory. And he's ooh, surprised, he's pretty good, actually, but, mm. but they're, they're not all going to be accurate. So the edition that we did, well, one of the things that made this edition different is that, is that we, we check the quotations against the, um, you know, the, 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 the Dickens originals and change them, thinking this is a book that would be read probably more by people interested in Dickens than people interested in Dickens. Okay. If someone misquotes, sorry, I'm just wondering, yeah. and if someone misquotes Dickens in a novel, you might note, you, you know, you, you might note it, but you certainly wouldn't change it. Would exactly, you? that's what I was going to say. I mean, if somebody was, uh, was, was writing abroad and quoting from memory, and that goes into the printed text, I'd say we keep that, but we note, and we talk about it in the introduction, yeah. and we record it in the AT. There is an interesting point on that that I think we still have to resolve, that in Rossetti there are illustrations, obviously. There's no known evidence that War had any involvement in the selection or subtitling of illustrations. And I, at the moment, have made in my textual variants a section which, you know, discuss with Martin and see what we do, because some of the um, titles of the paintings are incorrect. And do I change the awakening conscience to the awakened conscience? Um, do I say that it is not this sitter, it's another sitter? It's actually quite important because there's a 1975 edition of Rossetti, which should be completely out of bounds to me, it's long since, but that is the edition that said just how unreliable, lacking in knowledge and inaccurate war was about his subject matter. Well. And they quote those. <laughs> so they've got to be somehow in it. What a lovely place to finish.